Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout-out of thanks to Lauren, the latest member of our Patreon family. Lauren, thank you so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming a member of Patreon, you help us keep making new episodes week after week and keep them ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting this podcast and finding out about the perks available to subscribers, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. The description also includes a link to buymeacoffee.com where you can support us with a one-time tip no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's relax and read. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, we're reading bacteria, especially as they are related to the economy of nature, to industrial processes, and to the public health, by George Newman, M.D., F.R.S. Edinburgh, D.P.H. Cambridge, etc., Demonstrator of Bacteriology in King's College, London. Copyright 1899 by G.P. Putnam Sons and the Knickerbocker Press, New York. Let's begin. Preface The present volume is not a record of original work, nor is it a textbook for the laboratory. Theoretical and practical textbooks of bacteriology plentifully exist both in England and America. There are two large works widely used, one by Professor Cruikshank, entitled Bacteriology and Infective Diseases, the other by Dr. Sternberg, a manual of bacteriology. There are also in English a number of smaller works by Abbott, Ball, Hewlett, Klein, McFarland, Muir, Ritchie, and Sims Woodhead. This book is of a less technical nature. It is an attempt, in response to the editor of this science series, to set forth a popular scientific statement of our present knowledge of bacteria. Popular science is a somewhat dangerous quantity with which to deal. On the one hand, it may become too popular. On the other, too technical. It is difficult to escape the Scylla and Charybdis in such a voyage. I am much indebted to Professor Cruikshank, who in reading the manuscript has helped me by many valuable criticisms. My thanks are also due to Sir C.T.D. Ackland for many kind suggestions, and to Mr. E.J. Spitta, M.R.C.S., who has been good enough to take a number of excellent photomicrographs for me. Some other illustrations have been derived from the Atlas of Bacteriology, brought out jointly by Messrs. Slater and Spitta. For these also, I am glad to have an opportunity of expressing my thanks. It should be understood that the outline drawings are only of a diagrammatic nature. George Newman, London, 1899 Introduction we live in a world that is teeming with life. From the earliest times of man, that life has been studied and the observations recorded. 
Thus, there has slowly come to be a considerable accumulation of knowledge concerning the various forms, or morphology, and functions, or physiology, of organized life. This we call the science of biology. It has for its object the study of organic beings, and for its end, the knowledge of the laws of their organization and activity. Slowly, too, in the midst of this gradual accumulation of facts, we begin to see incoherence becoming coherent, chaos becoming cosmos, chance and accident becoming law. Further, the contemplation and comprehension which built up the edifice of modern biology is assuming a new relationship to practical life. Biology can no longer be considered only as an academic occupation or as a theoretical pablum upon which the leisured mind may ruminate. With rapid strides and determined face, this giant of knowledge has marched into the arena of practical politics. The world is opening its eyes to a reality which it had mistaken for a vision. This application of biology to life and its problems has in recent years been nowhere more marked than in the realm of bacteriology. This comparatively new science associated with the great names of Pasteur, Koch, and Lister, furnishes indeed a stock illustration of the applicability of pure biology. Turn where we will, we shall find the work of the unseen hosts of bacteria daily claiming more and more attention from practical people. Thus, biology even when clothed in the form of microscopic cells, is coming to occupy a new place in the minds of men. Its evolution, as Professor Patrick Geddes declares, forms part of the general social evolution. Certainly, its recent rapid development forms a remarkable feature in the practical science of our time not only in the diagnosis and treatment of disease, nor even in the various applications of preventive medicine, but in ever-increasing degree and sphere, microorganisms are recognized as agents of utility or otherwise no longer to be ignored. They occur in our drinking water, in our milk supply, in the air we breathe, they ripen cream and flavor butter. They purify sewage and remove waste organic products from the land. They are the active agents in a dozen industrial fermentations. They assist in the fixation of free nitrogen, and they build up assimilable compounds. Their activity assumes innumerable phases and occupies many spheres, more frequently proving themselves beneficial than injurious. They are both economic and industrious in the best biological sense of these terms. Yet bacteriology has its limitations. It is well to recognize this for the new science has in some measure suffered in the past from overzealous friends. It cannot achieve everything demanded of it, nor can it furnish a cause for every disease. It is a science fuller of hope than proved and tested knowledge. We are as yet only upon the threshold of the matter. As in the neighboring realm of chemistry, it is to be feared that bacteriology has not been without its alchemy. 
the interpretations and conclusions which have been drawn from time to time respecting bacteriological work have led to alarmist views which have not, by later investigation, been fully supported. Again, the science has had devotees who have fondly believed, like the alchemists, that the twin secret of transmuting the baser metals into gold and of indefinitely prolonging human life was at last to be known. But neither the worst fears of the alarmist nor the more sanguine hopes of the alchemist have been verified. Science, fortunately, does not progress at such speed or with such kindly accommodation. It holds many things in its hands, but not finally life or death. It has not yet brought to light either the Philosopher's Stone or the Vital Essence. What has already been said affords ample reason for a wider dissemination of the elementary facts of bacteriological science. But there are other reasons of a more practical nature. Municipalities are expending public monies in water analysis, in the examination of milk, in the inspection of cows and dairies, in the bacterial treatment of sewage, and in disinfection and other branches of public health administration. The newly formed National Association for the Prevention of Tuberculosis are increasing colonial possessions with their tropical diseases even medical science itself, which is year by year becoming more preventive, make an increasing claim upon public opinion. The successful accomplishment and solution of these questions depend in a measure upon an educated public opinion respecting the elements of bacteriology. Recently, it was urged that the first elements of bacteriology should be shadowed forth in the primary school. This course was advised owing to such knowledge being of value to those engaged in dairying. As we shall point out at a later stage, many of the undesirable changes occurring in milk are due to bacteria even as the success of the butter and cheese industries depends on the use and control of the fermentative processes due to their action. Much of the uncertainty attending the manufacture of dairy products can only be abolished by the careful application of some knowledge of the flora of milk. In Denmark and in Scandinavia, the importance of such knowledge is realized and acted upon. America, too, has not been slow to respond to those needs. But in England, comparatively little has been done in this direction. Whilst there can be no doubt as to the advantage of a wider dissemination of the ascertained facts concerning bacteria, it should be borne in mind that only patient, skilled observation and experimental research in well-equipped laboratories can advance this branch of science, or indeed train bacteriologists. The lives of Darwin and of Pasteur adequately illustrate this truth. Yet it is observable that states and public bodies are slow to act upon it. And frequently in the past, the most useful and substantial support for the advancement of science has been forthcoming only from private sources. As the world learns its intimate relation to science and the interdependence between its life and scientific truth, it may be expected more heartily to support science. Bacteria Chapter 1 
The Biology of Bacteria The first scientist who demonstrated the existence of microorganisms was Antony von Leeuwenhoek. He was born at Delft in Holland in 1632 and enthusiastically pursued microscopy with primitive instruments. He corroborated Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood in the web of a frog's foot. He defined the red blood corpuscles of vertebrates, the fibers of the lenses of the human eye, the scales of the skin, and the structure of hair. He was neither educated nor trained in science, but in the leisure time of his occupation as a linen draper, he learned the art of grinding lenses, in which he became so proficient that he was able to construct a microscope of greater power than had been previously manufactured. The compound microscope dates from 1590, and when Leeuwenhoek was about 40 years old, Holland had already given to the world both microscope and telescope. Robert Hooke did for England what Hans Janssen had done for Holland, and established the same conclusion that Leeuwenhoek arrived at independently, that a simple globule of glass mounted between two metal plates and pierced with a minute aperture to allow rays of light to pass was a contrivance which would magnify more highly than the recognized microscopes of that day. It was with some such instrument as this that the first microorganisms were observed in a drop of water. It was not until more than a hundred years later that these animalcules, as they were termed, were thought to be anything more than accidental to any fluid or substance containing them. Planets of Vienna was one of the first to conceive the idea that decomposition could only take place in the presence of some of these animalcules. This was in the middle of the 18th century. Just about a century later, by a series of important discoveries, it was established beyond dispute that these microorganisms had an intimate causal relation to fermentation, putrefaction, and infectious diseases. Spallanzani, Pasteur, and Tyndall are the three who more than others contributed to this discovery. Spallanzani was an Italian who studied at Bologna and was in 1754 appointed to the chair of logic at Reggio, but his inclinations led him into the realm of natural history. Amongst other things, his attention was directed to the doctrine of spontaneous generation, which had been propounded by Needham a few years previously. In 1768, Spallanzani became professor of natural history at Pavia, and whilst there he demonstrated that if infusions of vegetable matter were placed in flasks and hermetically sealed, and then brought to the boiling point, no living organisms could thereafter be detected, nor did the vegetable matter decompose. When, however, the flasks were very slightly cracked and air gained admittance, then invariably both organisms and decomposition appeared. Schwann, the founder of the cell theory, and Schultz, both showed that if the air gaining access to the flask were either passed through highly heated tubes or drawn through strong acid, the result was the same as if no air entered at all. That is to say, no organisms and no decomposition. The result of these investigations was that scientific men began to believe that no form of life arose de novo through abiogenesis, 
but had its source in previous life, biogenesis. It remained to Pasteur and Tyndall to demonstrate this beyond dispute and to put to rout the fresh arguments for spontaneous generation which Pouchet had advanced as late as 1859. Pasteur collected the floating dust of the air and found by means of the microscope many organized particles which he sowed on suitable infusions and thus obtained rich crops of animal culi. He also demonstrated that these organisms existed in different degrees in different atmospheres. Few in the pure air of the Mer de Glace, more in the air of the plains, most in the air of towns. He further proved that it was not necessary to insist upon hermetic sealing or cotton filters to keep these living organisms in the air from gaining access to a flask of infusion. If the neck of the flask were drawn out into a long tube and turned downwards, and then a little upwards, even though the end be left open, no contamination gained access. Hence, if the infusion were boiled, no putrefaction would occur. The organisms which fell into the open end of the tube were arrested in the condensation water in the angle of the tube. But even if that were not so, the force of gravity acting upon them prevented them from passing up the long arm of the tube into the neck of the flask. A few years after Pasteur's first work on this subject, Tyndall conceived a precise method of determining the absence or presence of dust particles in the air by passing a beam of sunlight through a glass box before and after its walls had been coated with glycerin. Into the floor of the box were fixed the mouths of flasks of infusion. These were boiled, after which they were allowed to cool and might then be kept for weeks or months without putrefying or revealing the presence of germ life. Here, all the conditions of the infusions were natural, except that in the air above them there was no dust. The sum total of result arising from all these investigations was to the effect that no spontaneous generation was possible that the atmosphere contained unseen germs of life, that the smallest of organisms responded to the law of gravitation and adhered to moist surfaces, and that microorganisms were, in some way or other, the cause of putrefaction. The final refutation of the hypothesis of spontaneous generation was followed by an awakened interest in the unseen world of microorganic life. Investigations into fermentation and putrefaction followed each other rapidly, and in 1863, Devane claimed that Palander's bacillus of anthrax, which was found in the blood and body tissues of animals dead of anthrax, was the cause of that disease. From that time to this, in every department of biology, bacteria have been increasingly found to play an important part. They cause changes in milk and flavor butter. They decompose animal matter, yet build up the broken down elements into compounds suitable for use in nature's economy. They assist in the fixation of free nitrogen they purify sewage. In certain well-established cases, they are the cause of specific disease, and in many other cases, they are the likely cause. No doubt, the disposal of spontaneous generation did much to arouse interest in this branch of science. Yet it must not be forgotten 
that the advance of the microscope and bacteriological method and technique have played a large share in this development. The sterilization of culture fluids by heat, the use of aniline dyes as staining agents, and the introduction of solid culture media like gelatin and agar and Cox plate method have all contributed not a little to the enormous strides of bacteriology. Owing to its relation to disease, physicians have entered keenly into the arena of bacteriological research. Hence, from a variety of causes, it has come about that the advance has been phenomenal. We shall now take up a number of points in the biology of bacteria which call for early attention and which are mostly the outcome of comparatively recent work on the subject. The Place of Bacteria in Nature As we have seen, for a considerable period of time after their first detection, these unicellular organisms were considered to be members of the animal kingdom. As late as 1838, when Ehrenberg and Dujardin drew up their classification, bacteria were placed among the infusorians. This was in part due to the powers of motion which these observers detected in bacteria. It is now, of course, recognized that animals have no monopoly of motion. But what, after all, are the differences between animals and vegetables so low down in the scale of life? Chiefly, too, there is a difference in life history, their structure and development, and there is a difference in diet. A plant secures its nourishment from much simpler elements than is the case with animals. For example, it obtains its carbon from the carbonic acid gas in air and water. This it is able to do, as regards the carbon, by means of the green coloring matter known as chlorophyll, by the aid of which, with sunlight, Carbonic acid is decomposed in the chlorophyll corpuscles, the oxygen passing back into the atmosphere, the carbon being stored in the plant in the form of starch or other organic compound. The supply of carbon in the chlorophyll-free plants, among which are the bacteria, is obtained by breaking up different forms of carbohydrates. Besides albumin and peptone, they use sugar and similar carbohydrates and glycerin as a source of carbon. Many of them also have the capacity of using organic matters of complex constitution by converting such into water, carbonic acid gas, and ammonia. Their hydrogen comes from water, their nitrogen from the soil, chiefly in the form of nitrates. From the soil, too, they obtain other necessary salts. Now all these substances are in an elementary condition, and as such, plants can absorb them. Animals, on the other hand, are only able to utilize compound food products which have been, so to speak, prepared for them for example, albuminoids and proteids. They cannot directly feed upon the elementary substances forming the diet of vegetables. This distinction, however, did not at once clear up the difficult matter of the classification of bacteria. It is true they possess motion, are free from chlorophyll, and even feed occasionally upon products of decomposition, three physiological characters which would ally them to the animal kingdom. 
yet by their structure and capsule of cellulose, and by their life history and mode of growth, they unmistakably proclaim themselves to be of the vegetable kingdom. In 1853, Cone arrived at a conclusion to this effect, and since that date, they have become more and more limited in classification and restricted in definition. Even yet, however, we are far from a scientific classification for bacteria, nor is this matter for surprise. The development in this branch of biology has been so rapid that it has been impossible to assimilate the facts collected. The facts themselves, by their remarkable variety, have not aided classification. Names which a few years ago were applied to individual species, like Bacillus subtilis, or Bacterium termo, or Bacillus coli, are now representative not of individuals, but of families and groups of species. Again, isolated characteristics of certain microbes, such as motility, power of liquefying gelatin, size, color, and so forth, which at first sight might appear as likely to form a basis for classification, are found to vary not only between similar germs, but in the same germ. Different physical conditions have so powerful an influence upon these microscopic cells that their individual characters are constantly undergoing change. For example, bacteria in old cultures assume a different size, and often a different shape, from younger members of precisely the same species. Bacillus pyocyanaeus produces a green to olive color on gelatin, but a brown color on potato. The bacillus of tetanus is virulently pathogenic, and yet may not act thus unless in company with certain other microorganisms. Hence it will at once appear to the student of bacteriology that though there is a great need for classification amongst the six or seven hundred species of microbes, our present knowledge of their life history is not yet advanced enough to form more than a provisional arrangement. We know that bacteria are allied to molds on the one hand and yeasts on the other, and that they have no differentiation into root, stem, or leaf. We know that they are fungi, having no chlorophyll, in which no sexual reproduction occurs, and that their mode of multiplication is by division. From such facts as these, we may build up a classification as follows. In the vegetable kingdom, there are the mucini and the thallophyta, or lowest forms of vegetable life, with no differentiation into root, stem, or leaf, leading to the protophyta, which have no sexual reproduction, leading to algae, where chlorophyll are present, and fungi, which have no chlorophyll, leading further to schizomycetes, who multiply by cell division or by spores, also called bacteria. Structure and Form Having now located microorganisms in the economy of nature, we may proceed to describe their subdivisions and form. For practical convenience rather than academic accuracy, we may accept the simple division of the family of bacteria into three chief forms. In the lower bacteria, one, the round cell form or coccus, two, the rod form or bacillus, and three, the thread form or spirillum. Higher bacteria include leptothrix, streptothrix, cladothrix, etc. 
A classification dependent as this is upon the form alone is not by any means ideal, for it ignores all the higher and complicated functions of bacteria, but it is, as we have said, practically convenient. Number 1. The Caucus This is the group of round cells. They vary in size as regards species, and as regards the conditions, artificial or natural, under which they have been grown. Some are less than one twenty-five thousandth of an inch in diameter. Others are half as large again, if the word large may be used to describe such minute objects. No regular standard can be laid down as reliable with regard to their size. Hence, the subdivisions of the cocci are dependent not upon the individual elements, so much as upon the relation of those elements to each other. A simple round cell of approximately the size already named is termed a micrococcus, Certain species of micrococci always or almost always occur in pairs, and such a combination is termed a diplococcus. Some diplococci are united by a thin capsule, which may be made apparent by special methods of staining. Of others, no limiting or uniting membrane can be seen with the ordinary high powers of the microscope. One frequently finds a species which is exactly described by saying that two micrococci are in contact with each other and move and act as one individual, but otherwise show no alteration, whilst others are seen which show a flattening of the side of each micrococcus, which is in relation to its partner. Perhaps the diplococci, in an even greater degree than the micrococi, respond to external conditions, both as regards size and shape. It must further be borne in mind that a dividing micrococcus assumes the exact appearance of a diplococcus during the transition stage of the fission. Hence, with the exception of several well-marked species of diplococci, this form is somewhat arbitrary. The third kind of micrococcus is that formed by a number of elements in a twisted chain, named streptococcus. This form is produced by cells dividing in one axis and remaining in contact with each other. It occurs in a number of different species, or what are supposed by many authorities to be different species, owing to their different effects. Morphologically, all the streptococci are similar, though a somewhat abortive attempt was once made to divide them into two groups, according to whether they were long chains or short. As a matter of fact, the length of streptococci depends in some cases upon biological properties, in others upon external treatment or the medium of cultivation which has been used. Sometimes they occur as straight chains of only half a dozen elements. At other times they may contain 30 to 40 elements and twist in various ways, even forming rosaries. The elements, too, differ not only in size but in shape, appearing occasionally as oval cells united to each other at their sides. The fourth form is constituted by the microcoxi being arranged in masses like grapes, the staphylococcus. The elements are often smaller than in the streptococcus, and the name itself describes the arrangement. There is no matrix and no capsule. This is the commonest organism found in abscesses, etc. The sarcina is best classified among the cocci, for it is composed of them 
in packets of four or multiples of four, produced by division vertically in two planes. If the division occurs in one plane, we have as a result small squares of round cells known as merismopedia. In both these conditions, it frequently happens that the contiguous sides of the elements of packets become faceted or straightened against each other. It may happen, too, particularly in the Sarkini, that segmentation is not complete and that the elements are larger than in any other class of cocci. They stain very readily. Nearly all the cocci are non-motile, though Brownian movement may readily be observed. 2. The Bacilli These consist of rods having parallel sides and being longer than they are broad. They differ in every other respect according to species, but these two characteristics remain to distinguish them. Many of them are motile, others not. The ends or poles of a bacillus may be pointed, round, or almost exactly square and blocked. They all, or nearly all, possess a capsule. Individuals of the same species may differ greatly, according to whether they have been naturally or artificially grown, and pleomorphic forms are abundant. 3. The Spirilla This wavy thread group is divisible into a number of different forms, to which authorities have given special names. It is sufficient, however, to state that the two common forms are the non-septate spiral thread, like the Spirillum obermeyer of relapsing fever, which takes no other form but a lengthened spirillum, and the spirillum which breaks up into elements or units, each of which appears comma-shaped, like the cholera bacillus. The degree of curvature in the spirilla, of course, varies. They are the least important of the lower bacteria. The higher bacteria group includes more highly organized members of the Schizomycetes. They possess filaments which may be branched, and almost always have septa and a sheath. Perhaps the most marked difference from the lower bacteria is in their reproduction. In the higher bacteria, we have what is in fact a flower, terminal fructification by conidia. In this group of vegetables, we have the Begiatoa, Leptothrix, Cladothrix, and at the top, the Streptothrix. It has been demonstrated that Streptothrix actinomycotica and Streptothrix maduri are the organismal cause, respectively, of actinomycosis and madura foot, two diseases which have hitherto been obscure. Pleomorphism This term designates an irregular development of a species. Different media and external conditions bring about in protoplasm as susceptible as mycoprotein a variety of morphological phases. These may occur in succession and represent different stages in the life history of a bacterium, or they may be involution forms resulting from a change of environment and occurring as faults in the species. In the Bacillus coli, B. typhosis, Bacillus of plague, and B. tuberculosis, pleomorphism undoubtedly occurs and is manifest in the change of shape. This is particularly marked in old cultures of the last named. The ordinary, well-known bacillus may grow out into threads with bulbous endings granular filaments, drumsticks, and diplococcal forms. Speaking generally, the older the culture, 
the more marked is the variation. Polymorphism is a term used to define the theory which held that bacteria were one of the intermediate shapes or forms between something lower and something higher in the vegetable kingdom. Neither pleomorphism nor polymorphism is fully understood, and many bacteriologists find shelter from both in the term involution form. What we do know is that the species already named, for example, take on diverse forms when placed under different conditions. From what we have seen of the diet of microorganisms, we shall conclude that in some form or other, they contain the elements nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen. All three substances are combined in the mycoprotein, or protoplasm, of which the body of the microbe consists. This is generally homogeneous, and there is no sign of a nucleus. It possesses a fortunate affinity for aniline dyes, and by this means organisms are stained for the microscope. Besides the variable quantity of nitrogen present, mycoprotein may also contain various mineral salts. The uniformity of the cell protoplasm may be materially affected by disintegration and segmentation due to degenerative changes. Vacuoles also may appear from a like cause, which it is necessary to differentiate from spores. Two other signs of degeneration are the appearance of granules in the body of the cell protoplasm, known as metachromatic granules owing to their different staining propensities, and the polar bodies which are seen in some species of bacteria. Surrounding the mass of mycoprotein, we find in most organisms a capsule or membrane composed in part at least of cellulose. This sheath plays a protective part in several ways. During the adult stage of life, it protects the mycoprotein and holds it together. At the time of reproduction or degeneration, it not infrequently swells up and forms a viscous hilum or matrix, inside which are formed the new sheaths of a younger generation. It may be rigid and so maintain the normal shape of the species, or on the other hand flexible, and so adapted to rapid movement of the individual. Here, then, we have the major parts in the constitution of a bacillus. Its body, mycoprotein. Its capsule, cellulose. But further than this, there are a number of additional distinctive characteristics as regards the contents inside the capsule which call for mention. Sulfur occurs in the Begiatoa, which thrive in sulfur springs. Starch is commoner still. Iron as oxide or other combination is found in several species. Many are highly colored, though these are generally the innocent bacteria, in contradistinction to the disease producing. A pigment has been found which is designated bacteriopurpurin. According to Zopf, the coloring agents of bacteria are the same as, or closely allied to, the coloring matters occurring widely in nature. Migula holds that most of the bacterial pigments are non-nitrogenous bodies. There are a very large number of chromogenic bacteria, some of which produce exceedingly brilliant colors. Among some of the commoner forms possessing this character are Bacillus et Micrococcus volatius, violet, Bacillus et Micrococcus orontiacus, orange, Bacillus et Micrococcus luteus, yellow, 
Micrococcus roseus, pink. Many of the sarkini, Bacillus aureus, golden yellow. Bacillus fluorescens liquefaciens et non liquefaciens, green. Bacillus pyocyanius, green. And Bacillus prodigiosus, blood red. And on that list, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Bacteria by Dr. George Newman. As is so often the case with these books, I found that far more interesting than I expected to. If you'd like to read this work for yourself and see the illustrations, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. I always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.